Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, what happens to Hawaii elders who don't have a safety net? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahialani Richardson. Many Hawaii residents look forward to retirement, but some find retiring on a fixed income is more challenging than they expected. Not everyone has the resources to weather life-changing events like divorce or serious health issues. What options are available to those who don't have a family to step in when independent living becomes too much to manage? Tonight on Insights, what happens to Hawaii elders who don't have a safety net? We want to hear from you, so join our conversation by calling 973-1000 if you live on Oahu or 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. You can watch Insight streamed live at pbshawaii.org. Click on the title of tonight's show or you can find us on Twitter at PBS Hawaii. Now on to our panel. Jerry Silva is the president of AARP Hawaii, a nonprofit organization that advocates for adults over 50, particularly in the areas of financial security, health care, housing, and transportation. Senator Suzanne Chun Oakland is chairwoman of the Human Services Committee and co-convener of the legislature's Kupuna Caucus. The state legislature is in the midst of preparing for a silver tsunami as baby boomers reach retirement age. Diane Tarada is the Community and Senior Services Division Administrator at Catholic Charities Hawaii. The nonprofit social services agency offers a wide range of in-home and community-based senior services. And Helen Castellan was just recently accepted into government-subsidized Kupuna Housing. After being on the wait list for six years, Ms. Castellan had to start collecting her Social Security benefits in her late 50s because of health reasons and discovered they were not enough to make ends meet. Welcome and aloha to you all. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Castellan, why don't I start off with you? You had to wait six years for Kupuna Housing and now there's a new development just tomorrow for you, right? Yes, yes. So it's really something that I had um, hoped and, and dreamed of being right across of Lana Kila Senior Center. That was my goal to live there and I be able to um, continue to do what I need to do at the center. So you get the keys tomorrow. Tomorrow. At 10 o'clock. <laughs> when you were waiting for this, I mean, did it go through your mind over and over again, why do I have to wait so long? Um, because the waiting list was, I knew at that time, it was like forever. It was a long waiting list. We have to wait until someone leaves or decide to vacate. Um, waiting list, I was told, my number was 1099, I think, at that time. That was my case number, and that was six years ago. And I thank my blessings for the social worker that had guided me to do that. And I thought, oh, so well, forever it's going to be, but hey, it's just like, it was a long wait, but it's it's here. Yeah, and that's a long wait, and given your financial resources and what was happening with your health, did you ever feel that that point was, was never going to come, and yes. did you feel desperate at times? Yes, I feel like, okay, am I really going to, to be able to be there, the place that I wanted to live, knowing that little by little there's more health issues that I have to deal with, so. Mm. But I have faith, I'm positive, that if it's for me, it will be. Uh, Mr. Silva, you know, when we hear about Helen's story, it, it really touches us. And there's so many people out there who are wondering, how can we retire when we reach age 65, if they retire at 65? Well, first of all, they may not want to retire or be able to retire at age 65. The bottom line is this. This may be a good news, bad news situation. The good news is people in Hawaii live long. We live longer than any other uh, people in any other state in the country. But the bad news is that there are three issues that you've got to confront. What am I going to do financially? Can I afford this? The second thing is, how am I going to get health care? Mm -hmm. And the third part of this thing is, what am I going to do for long-term care? These are not easy answers, but people need to confront the question and they need to have help to answer the questions. How much does it cost, let's say, for an assisted living facility um, for a span of, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Well, let's just start off this way. 
And if you uh, were to go into a, an, well, a skilled nursing facility and stay there for a year, in this state it costs about $135,000 a year. If you want to share a room, it cuts it down to $121,000 a year. So it's very expensive. Care at home costs an awful lot as well. So there are no easy answers. You know, is the care at home, would it be less expensive than, let's say, living in a, in a facility? Yes, but let's just talk about care at home. First of all, I think most people want to stay at home. Mm -hmm. They want to age in place. And that's possible if they can qualify for different types of care in home. And yes, it is less expensive up to a point. The only thing is that at some point, uh, that's not going to be an option. The thing is that care at home is based on a foundation of unpaid family caregivers. That's what makes this work. And in this state, there are about 154,000 unpaid family caregivers. They basically provide about $2 billion of services every year. Take them out of the picture and things would be very, very <coughs> grim. Senator, uh, when we talk about this silver tsunami, mm -hmm. what kinds of numbers are, are you looking at from the legislative perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, by 2030, one out of three people will be 65 years and older. So in order to plan for that, um, not only do families have to talk together about how they would be taking care of their parents or their grandparents, um, but also the housing situation that folks are in. What I see in my own district is many of our elders, um, their children had moved away either to the mainland or maybe another part of the state. They're coming back home to be close to their mom and mm -hmm. their dad and um, just be there for them. That's wonderful. For some others, they may not have family, so neighbors have taken on that responsibility. Almost 90% of all the caregiving is done at home. And so we need to support our caregivers. Um, oftentimes when they don't get the support, the caregivers themselves burn out or even pass away before the person they're caring for. Mm -hmm. So I know we funded Kupuna Care, which has helped a lot of middle income uh, families in particular. We have Medicaid options for many people that are of lower income. Um, and generally speaking, I, as Jerry was saying, people want to stay at home. So to the extent that we can train ourselves actually, including children, about how to take care of people as they get older, that's really important. We've, we don't have a comprehensive way of training ourselves on a daily basis so that we are prepared later on in life. Right, does, uh, mm -hmm. Ms. Tarada, does Catholic Charities offer that type of training for both both the elders and folks who are, you know, in that middle generation? Uh, we do some education about, you know, what growing old is like and some, uh, some information about caregiving, but we don't offer a, a scheduled kind of program for that, you know. I would say some of our education is we work with students, you know, we work with volunteers to have them give them some building um, information and then give them real life experience of working with seniors, yeah, mm -hmm. so that hopefully that experience helps them in the future with their own caregiving situation. Mm -hmm. Right, what about social security benefits? <clears throat> I mean, as time goes on, what can that realistically pay for, especially as the need becomes greater for either at-home care or assisted living? Um, you know, it's always a challenge for seniors who only have social security to rely on. Um, and the problem is that, you know, costs go up all the time, yes, and seniors are living on fairly fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times there's not a lot of options to increase income necessarily. So what we have to do, so what are a lot of times our staff are looking at what are the benefits and resources that they qualify for to reduce some of their other expenses so that they can use liquid cash like their social security to pay for things like rent or um, other kinds of bills that they have. You know, so for people like Helen is to look at how do we reduce costs for housing, yeah? Um, people who are eligible for things like um, Medicaid, you know, how, or, mm -hmm. or the Medicare savings plans to be able to reduce medical expenses because income itself is probably for many seniors that's increasing that is not going to happen yeah mm -hmm. so you got to look at how you can get other things in to be able to pay 
Ms. Castellan, I see you nodding. This is your life right here that uh, sure uh, Diane is talking about. Isn't Absolutely. It? And it's something that you have to, um, knowing that if you were able, if one is able to do at least a part time when they um, reach a certain age, because they do have part time, um, that would be helpful. But um, for personally, my, my case, for health issues, that's not an option for me. Mm -hmm. So my, um, it's just something that you have to deal with, what you have, and yes, prayers are answered. I've got this um, big, big uh, deal of uh, rent that is like one third of what I've been paying for all these years. Mm -hmm. And so that, with that. What kind of rent will you be paying uh, very, very <laughs> shortly? What, 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 what kind of rent will you be looking it's, at? It's um, 394 a month. Mm -hmm. Everything is included. A significant savings for you. Absolutely, from 800 somewhat dollars, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's water, electric, gas, and not including food. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I'm really blessed. I, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the city uh, recently looked at these accessory dwelling units, mm -hmm. and and the mayor um, supported it. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you heard about many, many years ago, Senator, mm -hmm. correct? Actually, it came to our the Kupuna Caucus's attention, the accessory dwelling units. I'm very happy that the City Council has acted on it here on Oahu. For many people that are property owners, that means that they can build a smaller, separate unit on their property, and that will help towards our um, housing shortage. We are expecting about 50,000 units to be short next year, mm -hmm. and so, in the committee that I had chaired um, the last three years, public housing was a part of that. We knew that um, you know, we had a 20% vacancy in public housing, and the beauty of public housing is it's 30% of your income. So most condominiums and apartments, you pay a price irrespective of your income. Mm -hmm. In public housing, there's a 30% um, uh, of your income and so I think for seniors especially on fixed income that's a very good option we were able to um, get the vacancy down to 2% and get the 13,000 application wait list down to 6,000 that's still a lot of people waiting mm -hmm. but in a three-year period that's a significant improvement right, right. so um, what we're doing now with all the transit stations there's 21 of them on Oahu, the rail, 19 of them have city and or state property. So what we're strategically looking at is the government owned properties. We would like to build um, a mix of affordable housing um, right near the stops, but co-locate kupuna services, child care services, um, things that really will make a difference for families. Mm -hmm. And that alone, if we are able to build strategically like that, will reduce the overall costs of your household. You know, because you'll be able to catch the train and go all over. You don't necessarily have to rely on a car anymore mm -hmm. um, if we plan right. If we don't, then we will still have to rely on the car. Right. You know, Mr. Silva, there is such a reliance on, on the family and the, and the extended ohana here in Hawaii, but what about those seniors who just don't have family to rely on? That's a difficult question, and you're right. You know, I've been in classes where people would stand up and say, I'm the last of my line. Mm -hmm. And it really gets down to this, that the safety net is very, very important to everybody, especially those who don't have family. And I'd just like to get back to Social Security for a moment. Mm -hmm. We're talking about what it costs to live here in Hawaii. Well, a Social Security check that you get here or in Arizona is the same Social Security check, but we've got very high costs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that happens when you become a senior, one of the expenses that goes up, probably your medical expenses. Thank you. And if you're paying a third for rent, you're probably paying 25% to cover your medical costs. Mm -hmm. And that cuts it down even more. When you look at Social Security, it's complex, and you really need some guidance into what you're going to do when it comes to taking Social Security. And there are about 240,000 people in this state who get Social Security benefits. It's a major part of their financial income. Mm -hmm. For 27 percent of the people in this state who are getting Social Security, it's the only income they have. Mm -hmm. 
Helen, go ahead. Uh, that that this is uh, you're in agreement. This is oh, absolutely. And like I say, if you're able to, then you'll be able to kind of back it up by working part time at least. Mm -hmm. But if with health issues, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you just have to face it that you have to deal with what you got. And medical, yes, medical. It's um, beyond. Uh, Ms. Tirada, what about Medicare and Medicaid? Does that help? Or, I mean, you're, you're still having retirees who are, who are living if, on the line. If they qualify for Medicaid, um, they could potentially get some long-term care support services in the home yeah, to help them. Mm -hmm. So that could be anything related to um, chore services, um, transportation services. So, <clears throat> and it certainly helps with the medical expenses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Medicare um, helps with some of the medical expenses, but there's still you have you still have to um, figure out what is the best prescription drug plan based on what all of your medications are. Um, so it's it, it is a very complex um, kind of formula to have to work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it helps, but you know if having a supplemental to your Medicare is really very helpful because most of the seniors have lots of. Uh, medication. Right. Um, Rob from Ina Haina has a really interesting question mm -hmm. and I'll pose it to the senator. Mm -hmm. Is it realistic to think the state will be able to afford to subsidize our aging population? Well I know um, the state budget as a whole it used to be most of it uh, was dedicated to public education. Department of Human Services budget has um, is now number one and it's because mm -hmm. of the Medicaid budget. When I first started, the budget for Medicaid was about $400 million. Now it's $1.8 billion. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that we do need to do. For example, in the housing supply area, part of the cost of rent is because we don't have enough of a supply. Mm -hmm. So we do need to address that. The other area in healthcare is what we're finding, you know, like Dr. Shintani or Kokua Kalihi Valley, They've seen how people, if they eat um, a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, can reduce the use of medicine. And so we really need to look at those, to me, wonderful opportunities um, and reduce the overall costs to our healthcare system and put more of that in other areas. Mm -hmm. Ms. Castellan, did you rely on programs, let's say on Meals and Wheels or others, to help bring food to your table? Um, actually, no. Um, but um, like she was saying that, um, like Suzanne was saying, um, that eating right is, is really helpful as far as health, to um, take care of your health mm -hmm. and eliminate all this medication. And yes, I have, um, I'm, I'm a living, um, one that I can agree with that. Yeah, you know, Ms. Tarada, as some seniors, you know, they get older, um, you know, just talking about nourishment and food, it sometimes doesn't become a priority because they just might forget about it or, you know, it's just, it's it's a lot to go out there to go shopping, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are services that will help folks go and do their grocery shopping, mm -hmm. okay? So, mm -hmm. so even with Catholic Charities, it has the transportation services that will take people grocery shopping. There are meals programs. Um, you know, a lot of what meals are, are for is um, social opportunities, yeah. So a lot of times what we find is that people, even if there's food, um, don't have the motivation or interest to eat because of the social factor. Right. So like at the, sen you know, the meals programs that they have around the island, including one at our senior center, um, gives people the opportunity to have reminder, okay, everybody's going to have lunch, the lunch is there, and your friends are there to talk with you, yeah, to be able to mm -hmm. um, enjoy the food with. And I think that's a big factor that I think a lot of mm -hmm. people forget, a lot of families forget that you can have the food available, but um, a lot of seniors don't eat it because there's nobody there to share it with. Yeah. That's a really important part, the, the, the communal aspect of it mm -hmm. all, I mean, for us all, and, mm -hmm. and the socialization mm -hmm. of, of being a part of these programs. That's why I think the senior centers, which is to me a very low cost, mm -hmm. has benefited many seniors because of that social interaction, <laughs> the activities where they actually can um, help other people in the community. Mm -hmm. We have seen people not having to go to any of the long-term care facilities. They are active, well, and basically pass away very 
um, fulfilled, I think, and happy. Yeah, the center so, actually did a drop yeah. dead study one time to look at how long people actually were able to stay at the center until they they actually died. So they never had to go into institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were well all the way almost to the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so we think that's a great um, gift that the center gives or any kind of place where people have the opportunity to participate in healthy activities that also offer social opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess the costs, you know, the gentleman from Aina Haino is talking about costs. To me, if, the, if we can engage our seniors because they have a wealth of knowledge and experience um, to the extent that we can do that. There are opportunities, maybe not to earn income, but I know in Colorado what has happened is elders basically help their government um, with filing as an example, filing, um, and then their tax, property taxes are reduced by government because of that community service. So there are different things I think we can explore that can reduce the overall costs, but also really um, the benefits that our kupuna are able to provide to our community mm -hmm. um, is recognized. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. Helen's a great example of somebody who not only receives services, but mm -hmm. also gives back mm -hmm. of her time and her resources. You know, people like Helen, are the reason why places like Lanakila can continue. You know, even um, Jerry was talking about um, AARP and the fact that they have so many volunteers that support AARP. And so the seniors have tremendous mm -hmm. ability to provide resources to support the activities of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Jerry, and uh, talk about that. You know, we have this huge volunteer base now that we will get more mm -hmm. volunteers if you look at it from a, a positive aspect, right? Well, I think the key thing, the key thing that we try to do is get information out to people. I know I talk to lots and lots of groups. And as I said at the beginning, this, the issues we, we're dealing with are complex. You know, for example, when people start looking at long-term care, where are they going to get it? Some people think that's done by Medicare. It's not. Uh, Social Security, what will it do for you? Quite a bit, but you have to know exactly what's available to you. So information is a big part of this. But as time goes by, I think Diane is absolutely right. So is the senator. You know, probably the best long-term care insurance you can have is good health. Mm -hmm. And the healthier you are, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. It's not the only thing you need to do, but it's certainly a major thing that you need to do. You know, going back to Social Security, uh, Bob from Waikiki wanted to know specifically from you, Mr. Silva, what has AARP done to get the tax on Social Security reduced or eliminated? The tax on Social Security. Let me tell you what we have done. One of the major things this last year was basically to change the cost of living adjustment, and we've definitely been against that. We know that this is a safety net program. We know that for example, here in Hawaii, the typical Social Security recipient gets about $1,200 a month. Women, less, because normally they, they stop work, they raise a family, they come back in. So it's really important that we keep the benefit that we have. We cannot allow Social Security to be diminished. And as things stand right now, Social Security is on pretty firm ground till about 2030. But if nothing is done, benefits will drop by about 25%. And if you think it's hard to live in Hawaii with $1,200 a month, imagine how difficult it is to, to go with $900 a month. Mm -hmm. Wow. $1,200 a month. I mean, that, that barely makes it by. <laughs> That's almost the equivalent to the federal poverty level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ms. Tarada, as you hear that you hear these stories and, and you know, you, you talk about volunteerism and getting more seniors out there and being active. Um, what are the spe specific programs that are out there for seniors who are, who are basically uh, maybe below the poverty level? Mm. Um, you know, there's a variety of things that seniors, even be, with very low incomes, can do um, to volunteer. Um, I just talked to the Senior Companion Program, and, the foster, and there's also a Foster Grandparents Program. So Senior Companion Program provides stipended volunteer opportunities for low-income seniors to be able to assist other seniors who are frail. Mm -hmm. the, senior, uh, the Foster Grandparents Program allows low-income seniors um, to get stipends to help um, 
children who are um, disabled. Yeah? So, you know, those are really good opportunities for seniors who are low income for whom a stipend may make a difference um, on whether or not they're going to be able to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Ms. Castellan, you, so you're volunteering at the Senior Center helping other seniors. What advice are you giving to them as they're trying to navigate through this very difficult maze? Well, first of all, I tell them, I, I try to get them to understand that there's services out there, number one, and then you need to be patient when you apply for this and you have to be on it. In other words, we're just another number when you put in an application and requesting for service. And so you need to sh keep calling them, you know, at least week to week and you really need to have this service. Mm -hmm. You know, Lana Kila Multipurpose Senior Center offers a lot of information and it, it's, it's open to whoever needs to know something um, activities there, exercises, you know, that helps them a lot too. Mm -hmm. And they can, it's, it's some place that they can socialize and yet benefit in more ways than one, mm -hmm. you know, and they're wonderful. They're, they're my ohana, my, my, my whole family. You know, Senator, um, you have caucuses on, on both ends of the spectrum. You have the Kupuna mm -hmm. caucus and then you have the Keiki caucus. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lenny from Manoa wants to know, how will our aging population affect the next generation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think because the cost of Medicaid has gone up so much, and a lot of that is with the long-term care expenses that the state pays for, for very low-income families, um, uh, individuals, that in itself is taking up much more of our state budget. So that does impact our public education system and how much money will go to that. And all the other um, 15 other departments that are, you know, agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, anyway. So I, that unless we are able to um, work on our long-term care financing bill that has been introduced several years, where each of us pays a little bit towards our own care, then I can only see the Medicaid budget going higher and higher because of the demographics. Mm -hmm. So we do need to have something proactive like that where there is a financing program for our long-term care needs. What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Silva? Well, about three years ago, the Long-Term Care Commission published a report and it basically started out mm -hmm. by saying this, Hawaii's long-term care system is broken. There needs to be, and that's exactly what the Senator is talking about, there needs to be a financing mechanism set up so that long-term care can become a little more affordable than it is right now. When you take a look at people who need long-term care, there are probably three groups. They're the wealthy, and the $135,000 a year may not uh, have a big impact on them. Then there are those people who are going to be supported by Medicaid, but there's another group in there right in the middle. Mm -hmm. They don't qualify for Medicaid. They don't have the money to pay for long-term care. There needs to be something in there to help them. And that's the kind of bill that we're talking about. Long-term care is maybe the toughest uh, of the, uh, the three things that we have to take a look at. Tonight, we're talking about the options available to Hawaii elders without a safety net. Please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments. Call 973-1000 if you live on Oahu and 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. Uh, Rita from Kaimuki gave us a call, and, and she shared an interesting story with us. She said her husband was bedridden uh, several years ago, and KCC offered a class in de helping to deal with this. It was very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Is this this class still offered. Do you know anything mm -hmm. about this, Ms. Harada, these kinds of opportunities? Um, actually, that was part of the Kupuna Caucus. We were able to get funding for Kapiolani Community College for caregivers, informal caregivers. Um, the money is still in the budget, but I think there's been a move away from um, teaching the informal caregivers, and that money is now used more for certifying um, folks that are Certified nurses, or professional, professionals, CNAs, CNA, mm -hmm. so and others. <clears throat> yeah. So we still need to. I think um, Cullen Hayashida was the person that coordinated that program at KCC. He's no longer there, but we hope to actually have him and the program possibly be in a more 
um, community-based setting. Mm -hmm. So on Ke'ave Street and Alamoana Boulevard, there's the old pumping station, and it'll be a senior um, center soon. We're hoping possibly that there would be the classes there and people would feel more comfortable it's in the community. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Ms. Tarada, can you share your experiences? You're a caregiver yourself, mm -hmm. and so moving from um, working with programs to, to be, you know, being in the trenches, so mm -hmm. you, you know, so to speak, what has it been like for you to be a caregiver and, and trying to navigate what can be a maze? Well, um, as somebody who works in the field, it's always different when it's your family. Um, you, you, you never have the same kind of situation as when you're dealing with somebody as a client versus somebody as a family. So it is very challenging. You know, I work long hours, but, um, and being able to um, have time and patience for um, somebody who, um, who needs a lot of time and patience is not always easy. Um, so I have great sympathy for um, caregivers. Um, I, I understand the, the challenges of every day is different and you never know what's going to happen and you have to hope that you have a job that is going to allow you the flexibility that if the person you're caring with ends up in the hospital mm -hmm. and need, or needs some other kind of assistance that you're going to be able to take the time to do that now. So it is a, it is a, I can understand stress levels that um, caregivers have to go um, through. Mm -hmm. I certainly understand. Uh, I, I am grateful that I have an employer that's very understanding about it, but that's because we have, you know, we work with people like this all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So it is a challenge, and I, you know, um, going back to the education piece, yeah, I think we have to figure out how to make education available on an ongoing basis. So, because caregivers need the education when they need it, yeah. It's not something you, most caregivers plan for in advance. It's like until the moment comes, mm -hmm. they don't realize that they need to get it and it has to be available like now. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that there'll be an opportunity to have that caregiver education available for the informal caregivers, the family caregivers again. Right, so That's if it. someone needed information right now mm -hmm. at this moment, mm -hmm. where do they start? Uh, they, they probably make a lot of calls. Um, they, there are different resources that are available. The city has just put out the um, newest version of the Senior Information and Assistance Handbook. This is a handbook that I would say that every single one of our employees who works in senior services has in their drawer and it's probably the most well-used handbook. Um, that Where do you get this from? You, I think they're making them available at the American Savings Banks, okay. which are sponsoring the handbooks, or to contact the um, Elderly Affairs Division with the City and County of Honolulu. Um, and I'm sure that they will be available to any senior activity that's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, are the um, Elderly Affairs also has um, sponsors several other kinds of handbooks for folks. This is one that's a legal handbook that's done by the Elder Law Program at the university on deciding what what's next and who in the world cares, but has a lot of good information. And then there is a very old, uh, kind of an older publication, a family caregiving guide that has some good resources. A little dated, but the information itself is useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Jackie from Kaimaki wants to know, has the legislature ever considered initiating rent control? Mm. Mm. I know I've introduced the bill. It has not had a hearing. <laughs> uh. um, and I know there's pros and cons to it. Yeah. Um, Talk yeah. about some of the pros and cons. I mean, this would be based on someone's age, income, those sort of factors. What I've heard, because I've not really met landlords in other states where there is rent control, mm -hmm. but sometimes when there is rent control imposed, then people will start taking back their property and not renting them. Mm. So that's a negative. Mm -hmm. Um, the positive you're hoping is that the landlords will keep the rents down and people will be able to afford it. But it's with the kind of economy we have where there is not too many housing options right now, um, to me a better way to do it is to provide the housing supply. The demand is high, 
the housing supply is low. We need to increase that. So the accessory dwelling units that you spoke mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. is one very good way that all our property owners can help with the housing shortage. Planning um, intelligently around each of the transit stops, utilizing our state-owned public housing properties and redeveloping, you know, so for example, Merite Housing. Merite Housing has 384 units. Um, the Public Housing Authority is looking at potentially building, redeveloping that property at Liliha, King Street, and Vineyard Boulevard, and building up to 1,500 units of you know, different income levels. Um, that is something the community has to talk about. You know, that is mm -hmm. a, a very large number of units. But if we can look at our state properties, then the cost of the land, which is about one third of the cost of everything to construct homes um, would be eliminated because we own the property already. Uh, Mr. So. Silva, a lot of seniors, and this is a, a generalization for many people in Hawaii, they are land rich but cash poor, mm -hmm. and they just do not have the, those liquid assets, and, and that's where people can run into a lot of trouble, paying rent, taxes, and such, so forth. There are some other options. I mean, reverse mortgages are instruments that can mm -hmm. offset some of that. Uh, certainly you can downsize, you can move to a smaller place, you can possibly develop a small rental unit. So there are some options, but uh, none of them pleasant, none of them really pleasant. Mm. Uh, Lorna, go ahead, Senator. What, um, one of my friends in Manoa basically had two bedrooms, and so he made it available for two people to live with him. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of seniors that um, have their children have moved out already, that may be a very good option. And I know some contractors are getting into the business of redesigning existing homes so that you have different entryways. Hmm. So you can have a family move in with a kupuna. Um, they still have their privacy both ways, but at least the family or someone that moves in to the home with someone um, could be the eyes and ears and maybe take care of the kupuna, you know, that's living by him or herself. Mm -hmm. Ms. Castellan, do you wish that you had those uh, available to you six, seven, eight years ago? Um, no, yes and no, but um, the property that I'm leaving behind um, is not up to, or nothing like that would come about. Mm -hmm. So, again, because of um, your fixed income, I just had to deal with that and stay there. I was in a studio, so moving into a one bedroom, I'll be waltzing. Uh -huh. I'll be dancing from room to room. Uh -huh. It's a studio that I've been, I'm in too, so there's really. And even though it is a studio, I mean, you've been there for a very long yes. time. And so what about the emotional aspects of, of moving and just, you know, physically moving your things and going from one point to another? I, I mean, that's very stressful for anyone. Yes, I made a list where, what I need to bring first of all in, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, you know, and I, I mean, like, I'm starting all over, and which is okay, um, it'll be good. Mm -hmm. Does uh, Catholic Charities, Ms. Toretta, help seniors move, or are there programs out there that, that help them, let's say, downsize, because it can be an incredible situation to, to decide if you're going to move from a house to someplace a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Well, what we do have is a housing assistance program for seniors, yeah, that we do housing counseling for um, seniors who are looking um, for affordable housing. And the challenges of helping seniors look for housing is that it is now become a multiple step process, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because as you see, it, it took Helen six years to get into the place where she's going to move into tomorrow. Um, so a lot of seniors, because their ultimate goal or their ultimate need is to be in a 30% project because they're so low income, have to take multiple steps of maybe going to a unit that's in affordable building that they got to pay a little bit more than they can afford, um, get some, you know, use some, some, whatever their savings, then maybe go to something else, you know, go to a community, a neighborhood where they don't really want to live. It's maybe too far from everything they know mm -hmm. until they get to the place. So we, we often see mm -hmm. um, seniors coming back for 
assistance because it does take a long time to get to a place where you're going to feel like, okay, this one I can afford for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And many of these seniors who uh, are living without a safety net are, are women, aren't they? Yes, the majority, well, in the older population, the majority are women, and women tend to be the ones who are coming with the most um, challenged incomes. Yeah, you know, um, Jerry was talking about, you know, they often take breaks from employment, um, and so their social securities are lower, and all mm -hmm. kinds of things like that, that, yes, most of the people that we deal with are women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Silver, is there anything out there that helps women specifically uh, in terms of safety net? No, I don't think there's anything out there that helps women specifically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of need out there and there's a lot of help that's needed, but you know, let's just drop back just a moment. One of the biggest needs of caregivers, and the majority of caregivers are women, is information. And these books are really great. They're really a great source of information. But there are certain trigger points in a, in a caregiver's life, let's say when the person they're caring for goes into the hospital and comes out with additional needs. You know, for example, you have to get shots. That's how you get your, uh, that's how you, you get your medication in, or you have to be put on an IV. And in a situation like that, the need for the instruction is right now. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're concerned about. And that's why one of the things AARP is pushing is something called the CARE Act that would require hospitals to recognize caregivers and to give them basic instruction so that once the patient gets home, the patient can continue to live safely and, uh, and thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about this influx of seniors uh, as, mm -hmm. as our Hawaii population mm -hmm. ages, and um, Becca from Makiki wants to know, are agencies like Catholic Charities ready for the influx of seniors? I don't think anybody's ready. I don't think our community is quite ready. We've been talking about this um, influx of seniors for many, many years now. Um, I, I don't, I can't say that we're totally ready. There are people who are out there who are not able to receive the services they need for various reasons. You know, we still need to do a better job of getting information out. We still need to do a better job of helping people prepare. We still need to do a better job of having um, adequate services for folks. Mm -hmm. We do have something called the Aging and Disability Resource Center. So on Maui, Kauai, and Big Island, they actually have um, you know, an assessment that is done for individuals and then um, matching up services in the community mm -hmm. to support them in their home. Um, the city and county of Honolulu is starting going through this now mm -hmm. and starting it. And mm -hmm. I know Diane is involved with this. So I, did you want to explain a little bit? Um, well, the, the whole idea of the ADRC is to become sort of a one point of entry uh, or multiple point of entry, but we're getting to the same place. And there is a um, what they're doing is they're doing basic assessments to be able to identify what people's needs are and then to get them into the appropriate services so that you, you know previously at least for Oahu you'd go to one provider get services maybe in one area but maybe not be looking at the full range of services so this will be able to help have people go to one source to be able to get a comprehensive look at these are all your needs and these are all the pieces that would fit for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, someone brings up about the homelessness and mm -hmm. you know, with some seniors with no safety net, they are, are pushed into homelessness. Mm -hmm. and th does any of you know what percentage of the homeless are seniors? Mm. I'm not too sure. I don't know what the actual percentage, but it's a growing, per it's a it's growing, growing number. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're, we're seeing a lot of folks, because of their health, they have to make a decision, rent or medication, or you know, there's dementia, other things where they are not able to live independently, um, fixed income, rents going up, mm -hmm. and also financial exploitation. That is a huge growing concern where family members or those that may be caregiving um, are actually taking the elders money mm -hmm. and then they are on the streets. So there's multiple reasons for that, but yes, it's a growing number yeah. of people. You know, Sherry and Kahala, she, mm -hmm. she's, she wants us to look at some of the positive issues mm -hmm. here and, and I think uh, Ms. Castellan, you, you can probably shed light on that. What, what are some of the positives of what we call the, the silver tsunami? The positive side is we just have to uh, 
stay positive in however it it's it's handed over or however it it's happening and it will for me i believe that it will get better we just have to be positive and deal with our everyday need mm -hmm. continue to be healthy do a lot of exercising mm -hmm. and stay as happy and and have faith that no matter what is going on or what is coming about, however, we have to deal with it mm -hmm. and be positive and it will be okay. I think I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of our seniors have so much expertise and we really need to capitalize on it. I mean, there's really a lot of neat things that their, their life um, has well, their life has offered, and basically they're in a position, I think, to be able to share all of that knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen intergenerational programs where our kupuna and our young children are together. I mean, it makes it such a positive difference when you have caring adults taking care of our children. Um, in so many different settings. Right, uh, Jin from Honolulu yeah. said, it should be part of the high school curriculum to teach students what it's like mm -hmm. to get old. Your mm -hmm. thoughts, Mr. Silva? <laughs> yeah, I, I never envisioned getting old when I was uh, a few decades. <laughs> I don't think any of us thought no. about I it. I always really. wanted to be old. I always <laughs> wanted to be old, but I didn't mm -hmm. expect it, it was a package deal. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. When we're young, we want to get old. Mm. Well, I think the thing is that, one, we need to face the fact that uh, more of us are going to get old and we are going to get even older than we are right now. And we have to deal with that. Exactly. The, the critical thing here is that we have to ensure that the safety nets are not diminished. We have to make sure that mm -hmm. Social Security stays strong. Not for those of us who are elderly now, but for our kids who are going to be yeah. elderly soon. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with other programs like the Older Americans Act that the Senator knows a lot more about than I do. But I mean, that's a source of benefits that mm -hmm. we can't let that be degraded. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, you know more of these housing options. What other housing options are there for seniors who, who need more resources? Well, there's a limited supply of housing, you know, mm -hmm. which is why Helen has waited six years. Mm -hmm. um, so 30% projects are always in high demand, particularly 30% projects in Honolulu. There are, um, there's a lot of, uh, if, if you have money, you know, there's a lot of certainly assisted living kinds of um, options for you. Um, I, I really wish that more private landlords would really consider uh, prioritizing um, offering units for seniors because we have, what we always tell landlords is that seniors are going to be your best um, renters because they will pay rent first. They will pay it before anything else. You know, they understand the importance of trying to pay rent. Um, so, you know, there are some small group homes. Actually, Catholic Charities runs a few small group homes where mm -hmm. uh, five seniors live together, share a sort of an independent living kind of situation um, so that they can share in the care of a home but also in the cost of living there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we get calls from seniors who have ended up on the street because they can no longer afford their rent, they got evicted for whatever reason, um, there are no immediate options. Yeah, there is really only one transitional project in town um, for seniors, and it's usually full. There's a wait list to get into transitional. The um, emergency shelters are often um, not great options for seniors just because of physical um, limitations yeah, mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. vulnerability in those kind of situations. So. It, it's scary to, mm -hmm. when you're living on the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Silva, you talked about, you know, planning, planning, mm -hmm. planning, but what about for those seniors who just didn't plan? And, and why do you think there was no planning? Well, I don't think people actually knew that costs were gonna go up as, mm -hmm. as high as they have. I don't think they knew at that point that housing was gonna be a challenge. and. That's part of the problem, that there probably needs to be an educational program that talks about what it's going to be like to get old and what, the, uh, what you're going to need, whether it's financial need or, or medical need or long-term care need. This has to be brought up early on so that you can address it. One of the other things, though, that uh, the senator brought up is this. Housing is a big issue. 
and transit-oriented development is not an immediate solution, but it certainly has to be part of a long-term solution. We also passed um, this past year the Rental Housing Trust Fund, which we established back in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we were able to infuse $40 million of bond financing and up to another $38 million in um, Bureau of Conveyance tax money, so $78 million to start building the more affordable units. Many of the, um, the money that was in the Rental Housing Trust Fund in the past has gone to elderly housing. So we have the House, Hawaii Housing Development Corporation, Hawaii Housing, uh, Pacific Housing Corporation. There's a number of nonprofits, mm -hmm. Catholic charities. They've really focused on elder housing. So I have a lot of hope. I also have a lot of hope in Hawaiian homelands that they will start considering rental units. I know that is a discussion of the commissioners, but for many of our Hawaiian people, elders and families that are starting out, rentals will actually help mm -hmm. um, you know, provide very needed housing. Mm -hmm. And for the younger families, you know, they can actually save by renting mm -hmm. and then be able to purchase a home. So I, I hope that there is a decision made soon mm -hmm. with regards to Hawaiian homelands. Ms. Toronto, when you look at these services uh, that Catholic Charities provides, what is your, the, the number one service that is most requested? Um, the number one service is probably housing assistance, yeah, mm -hmm. um, because that, that has become a really critical issue for seniors. Um, between our housing assistance and our transportation service, those are our, our popular um, programs, yeah, where right. we get the most mm -hmm. inquiries because the other issue is that people need access, need to be able to access different places. Yeah. Also rep payee services. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we don't do rep PA services, yeah. but um, that, that certainly increase. is something that um, is also needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's happening is elders are not able to take care of their finances, um, <clears throat> and we do need more of those types of services mm -hmm. for, in order to pay their bills, et cetera. Ms. Castellon, you know, we talked about transportation. How, how do you get around on a daily basis when you're going? Mm -hmm to the Lanakila Senior Center and you're going from home and you're going shopping? Mm, I do have um, a yearly bus pass. Mm -hmm. I gave up driving when I was diagnosed with cancer three years ago. Uh, I lost, um, my car was so old and did, even if you could purchase a part, but there was no part. <laughs> and so it went to car heaven. So I, I got really upset about that. So I says, no driving. Well, I couldn't anyway, and then I had to deal with the bus, which is okay. But now um, it's mostly Catholic charities, and I, I I just praise them. I praise them. I thank them every time when they come and get me mm -hmm. and bring me home, bring me to the doctor. I mean, is it e as easy as just picking up a phone and calling and say I need a ride somewhere? Uh, well, it's not a taxi service. Uh -huh. <laughs> it has to be scheduled a little yes. bit. <laughs> right. How far in advance? Um, it kind of depends. Yeah, sometimes they'll have openings where somebody has an urgent need, and they'll they'll call in and they can get a ride. But um, they usually tell them at least a couple of days mm -hmm. you know, um, would be helpful. So usually doctors' appointments, making a, a concerted effort to go on a specific shopping trip and that sort mm -hmm, of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, our callers wanted to know again um, about the services that are available and mm -hmm. I think it's really mm -hmm. important uh, mentioning again, Ms. Tretta, can you mention this book again from the Elderly Affairs uh, Sure, office? this is the um, Senior Information Assistance Handbook. It's mm -hmm. only printed every two years, so this is very current. It's um, produced by the City and County Elderly Affairs Division. Um, they can check their local American Savings Bank um, branch or they can call 768-7700. I've got it right in the back. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should show Yeah, there we go. 768-7700. Seven, <laughs> seven, to find out how they can get a copy. If they have access to a computer, it's also available online at the Elderly Affairs Division website. And when you thumb through that, what kind of service is it? Is it does it group it by housing, Social Security? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? It it has a table of contents that has all the different um, topic areas. So legal and advocacy, it'll have health care, it'll have education, community services, and it has all the numbers for all of the 
and what are called Area Agencies on Aging, or what the ADRCs, I, I guess, the Aging and Disability Resource Center now, on each of the islands. So that, mm -hmm. um, you know, if mom or dad lives on another island, um, they can still call to find out what, what is available for their parents on that particular mm -hmm. island. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, some of the need on the neighbor island. And, and Senator, you see things from, from the overall state perspective. Is there, you know, are there resources going out to those rural areas on the neighbor islands? I, there is through the Kupuna Care Program in particular. Mm -hmm. And much of what is listed here um, is funded with Kupuna Care monies, which is state monies. Um, I know that over the years we've tried to grow that pot. It used to be $4.8 million. Um, it has gone up, what well, went up to $9 million, and then it fell back down about a million to less, $1.2 million less. We do need to advocate for more of that money because it is flexible. It helps with meals, transportation. It allows for respite, um, even home modifications. So there's the Kupuna Care money is current. Yes. Th I, thank you so much. Mm. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing all of this information with us tonight and all of you a uh, very enlightening evening mm -hmm. and, and getting some of the word out about these services. Thank yeah. you tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, the cycle of homelessness can be hard to break. Some Hawaii residents have done just that, demonstrating the resilience, perseverance, and courage to change their circumstances. What support did they have along the way and what lessons can they share with others? On the next Insights, how have people worked their way out of homelessness? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lani Richardson. Ahui ho.